Welcome to the Probate Realtor Show, your one source for selling and buying real estate through trust and probate. Hear directly from the best attorneys and trusted advisors on how executors and administrators navigate the probate process in and out of court. Being a personal representative or successor trustee can be a daunting task, and often beneficiaries don't have a clear plan. Let us help you make the right decision for your clients, your family, and your legacy. And now, here's your host, the probate realtor himself, Matias Baker Mazzucci. Welcome, everybody. Today, we are talking to Wendy Hartman. Wendy, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm glad to be here, Matias. It's a pleasure to have you here. Wendy's an attorney who specializes in estate planning, taxation, business planning, adoption, as well as LGBT matters, which is a niche which I find very interesting and we're definitely going to delve into later in the episode. But for now, let's start with the basics. Okay. Wendy, what is estate planning? Estate planning is an individual's means of stating how they want to dispose of their assets. So I have children. If I'm married, I want it to go to my spouse potentially first, and then my children. If I'm a single person, I want it to go to whoever I want it to go to. So we use several documents to provide that. First one we use is a revocable living trust, which says, this is my wishes. This is who I want to act on my behalf in the event I can't act for myself. And this is how I want my estate to be distributed. If it goes to my children, it goes to my children either outright if they're adults, or it may go to them in a you know, 25, 30, 35 kind of arrangement. So it's your wishes set on paper. The other document everybody seems to know is a will. When we have a trust, we use what's called a pour over will. It says, I created my trust. I want my assets distributed, not by state law, which would be if there were no documentation, but by the way I set forth in my trust. And if for any reason we have an issue with a, an asset not being titled properly, we can go to the court. We can say, court, she's got these documents. It's um, a simple, simpler procedure, nothing simple in Los Angeles County, but it's a simpler procedure to get the assets transferred into the trust and disposed of under the trust. Very nice. And, and then we also use healthcare directives, durable powers of attorney. We do some um, dispositive wishes as far as what you want to do, funeral, burial, cremation, things like that. So there's a whole uh, series of documents we use in an estate plan. Very nice. Now, let's talk about the niche that you're in, which is, well, other amongst the other services that you provide, you also have a specialization in the LGBT community, serving the LGBT community, which I think it's a remarkable thing. Tell me a little bit about some of the potential legal challenges uh, that same-sex couples may have. I know that now the protection has changed and you know it's, it's much easier, but I'm assuming that when you started serving this niche, things were not as simple as they may have been now. Is that correct? Yeah. Prior to 2000 or 2003, we really had no protections. In 2003, right. in California, we got a domestic partnership law, which allowed for visitation and the rights under um, insurance for a company if your partner works for a company. In yes. 2003, that was expanded retroactively to say, if you're registered with the state of California, not a county, not a city, if you register with the state of California, you're going to get protections just like a spouse would. So we're dealing with 2003, 2005, 2008, mm -hmm. a variety of changes. In 2008, we had a short window where California, we could marry. Right. So same-sex couples were able to marry in 2008. If you marry during that five-month window, you are legally married, okay? If you didn't marry but entered into do domestic partnership with the state at any point between then and even now, you're recognized as a spousal equivalent for the state of California, but mm -hmm. not necessarily for federal government assistance. So in 2008, we had marriage equality here in California, we lost it again just several months later, and then people were registering. People were going to Canada to get married. Right. But in 2000, I believe it was 14, and I apologize because I may have just tripped that up, and I apologize. Around 2014, we got federal rights as far as marrying, and that across the board allowed for same-sex couples who chose to, to become married, and it should be recognized by not only the federal government, their individual states. For a while, it was a state-by-state state process. Right. Okay. Where we are today 
is all those marriages that occurred during the legal framework are all recognized as legal marriages. Even if we were to lose marriage in the future at some point, those marriages, if they were done at a time and place when it was valid under our laws, then it's a valid marriage. And that most likely, and I'm just going to be cautious, most likely could never be taken away. We may lose future marriage rights, but hopefully that won't happen. Absolutely right. Correct. So let me ask you a question. Now, where we are at right now, when, when an L- LGBT couple approaches you and says, look, we, we need to do some estate planning, what are some of the things that you uh, first ask them to provide? Well, when I, when I sit down with a couple, and there's going to be different things for a, a single person and a couple, when mm-hmm. I sit down with an LGBT couple, number one, what's their status? Right. Okay. We need to acknowledge their status and recognize their status. Many couples are together 30, 40, 50 years even, Mm -hmm. but never took any legal action. Right. Without any type of legal action, they are still legal strangers under the law. And they have no marital protections. Okay. They'd have to go to court and sue under certain procedures and certain legal cases, Mm -hmm. and they might win, but they have no legal standing technically. They have to take it to court to, to perfect any action. Mm-hmm. Okay. So maybe they said we we registered in the 90s. Where did you register? We registered right. with our employer or the city mm-hmm. of Los Angeles right. or the county of Los Angeles. Okay. Did you register with the state? We don't know. So we have okay. to check and see any po- any point whether or not a registration occurred mm-hmm. with the state of California because that's the only one that's legally recognized. Right. Okay. Then are you married? Yes, we got married in Canada in 2003, right. whatever year it was, Canada w- uh, marriages were valid, so California recognizes those as a marriage equivalent. We got married in um, 2004, I think mm-hmm. it was 2004, when um, the governor opened it up for marriage, and that marriage is not valid, okay? Mm, okay. All right, we got married in 2008, in October of 2008, right before Prop 8, turned overturned marriage. We're good. It's a perfect marriage, okay? We got married married after 2014. We're good. No problem with the marriage, okay? So we have to look at the status. All right. Then what I also said is many couples go back many years. Okay? Right. So we have to look to where the legal relationship started. Mm. Okay? In California we have what's called community property rights. Community property rights means that every party in the couple, so both partners, once they either become registered domestic partners or uh, married, every dollar they receive and every debt they incur and every expense they incur during that legal period are community property assets, debts, liabilities. Okay. Now the exclusion to that would be something that was inherited or received right. by gift or something you came into the re- the legal relationship with. So mm-hmm. if I owned rental property before I became a registered domestic partner or I became married, then that is my separate property. Right. Okay? So we have to analyze the assets that everybody has, the source of the assets, when they acquired them, how they acquired them. For a long time, explaining community property to same-sex couples was very difficult because mm-hmm. many, many same-sex couples still to this day, and I'm sure it's it's true for a, uh, an opposite-sex couple as well, but many more in the gay and lesbian community keep their assets separate. Right. So I may have a bank account and my spouse may have a bank account, okay? Mm-hmm. But if I earned anything I put into that bank account while I'm married or in my registered domestic partnership, then my spouse has a right to half that money, okay? Right. And vice versa. She has a right to half mine. I have a right to half hers, okay? So we always look to the source of the funds, what, how they're dealing with the funds, and uh, what their understanding of those funds are, okay? If alternatively, I received an inheritance from my parents, and I stuck that in a Morgan Stanley or a Merrill Lynch account, something like that, and I retain the integrity that that's my separate property, then no problem, that's my separate property, okay? So that's very similar to same-sex couples. I mean, that's exactly how it is. It's the same, right? It's the same thing. Opposite and same-sex couples, it's the same thing. Once we receive marriage equality, then it's the same either way. The the wrinkle with a same-sex couple is often that history. Right. 
And then yes. it's also how they retain their assets now, because somebody could have just been married in the last five years, say, or three years, and we have to explain community property to them because they often say, well, this is my bank account. This is his bank account. Right. Okay. That may be your bank account. That may be his bank account in your name. However, we have to trace the funds that went into that bank account. Right. Okay. Okay. So let me ask you a question. A, a, a same-sex couple, like this is a perfect example of what you said. Sometimes they've been together for 30 years, 40 years maybe, mm -hmm. but right. they ne they didn't have 30 years, 40 years ago, they would have gladly gotten married, but they didn't have that right. They didn't right. have that right 30, 40 years ago. So now they're coming to you and they say, just like you say, you know, we only, you know, we got married three years ago or we didn't even get married. You know, at this point, I mean, like, you're not like life is routine. You know, if you're living somebody 40 years, you're not thinking about going out there maybe and getting married. So what is your advice with somebody that says, look, we are a family. We are, you know, we've been together 40 years and we want to make sure that one, when one of us passes, the other is protected just as much as a spouse would be. Um, what do you recommend? Like say you should get married or do you say, you know, well, you know, you don't necessarily have to get married as long as we do the estate. You can name anybody to be your beneficiary um, as long as we do the estate planning properly. To right. Make sure that so, mm -hmm. again, couples are still there's many couples still that have no legal relationship status wise. OK, yeah. so they'll, they may come to me and I said, OK, let's look at the options you have. The right. most critical is if you want to protect each other, documentation is critical. OK, right. you have to state that this is your beneficiary. You have to state that this is the person you want to allow to make healthcare decisions for you right. or deal with your business and property in the event of your incapacity. So it's critical that documentation is put into place as soon as possible. Okay. Alternatively, we talk about getting becoming domestic partners or becoming married. And right. there are still many couples today, I think the number is much smaller than it was years ago, are still becoming just domestic partners as opposed to marrying. They are stepping into certain tax consequences and things. But for the state of California, they recognize as a marriage equivalent and to them at the moment, that's enough. Okay. Right. One thing right. that's important to understand is the filing of tax returns for a domestic partner and a married couple are different. Mm -hmm. And you really want to address that with a CPA who knows how right. to file tax returns for a domestic partner, because there's, there's certain things that need to be done on both returns to provide for the fact that they are domestic partners. That makes sense. And, and you just mentioned something, actually, that I remember hearing years ago, a heartbreaking story of, of an LGBT couple who had been together 30, 40 years, didn't have any documents, and then you know, one of them ended up going in the hospital mm -hmm. and the family, the, the adult kids, you know, didn't, you know, didn't let them see, you know, something because there was no healthcare directive in place. We, you know, obviously, you know, um, so you mentioned the healthcare directive and that's part of your estate planning process. Right. Um, are these healthcare directive now subject to challenges from, for instance, you know, a family member that was not involved or do you feel that you know, they, they're solid, they're, they're on solid ground right now. <clears throat> For the most part, they're on solid ground. Okay. Okay. Basically, we're saying that the person who executed that healthcare directive and said, I want my partner to be able to make the decisions, they can keep my family informed or discuss it or communicate with my family, but this is the person I want to make the decision for me. Right. If it's done under the proper formalities, mm -hmm. if the drafting person feels comfortable that the person has the capacity to do that, then they're usually completely valid and honored, okay? And a family member would be hard pressed. The story you were talking about where they put the, the gentleman, most likely were thinking the same story, in a nursing home and the family wouldn't let the partner come visit him, right, wouldn't make right. any decisions, do anything. And he ultimately wound up losing the house mm -hmm. because it was in the name of the first partner. Right. And that's also very important is, is titling of assets. Because right. if you're not married and you have you want to leave assets to your partner, that's fine. Also, if you buy a house and still don't have documentation, whoever's on title is going to be the recognized owner at the death of right. either of you. And the family could come in and swoop that house away. And they've done that on multiple occasions. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, my business is to sell real estate in, in, in trust and probate. And, and I see... Unfortunately, a lot of these things are contentious, you know, like, I mean, 
I, I, I do sales where the court is ordered the sale after, after you know, a, a settlement has been reached and multiple siblings, if they squabble among themselves, which, you know, the, the time I spend in, in probate court, I always make this joke. Sometimes it's a bit like a, a Jerry Springer episode if you spend enough time in probate court. Same sex couples. Have you noticed in your experience, uh, if they had, you know, adult children, for instance, are this challenged? Any document can be challenged. Obviously, nothing is, is there. There's no there's no magic bullet for any of this. But if you notice that there there are more ch there is a tendency to have more challenges, or is it kind of like the regular thing? In other words, like the challenges just happen, just like in in, in every family. The challenges seem to be more on the long range. The couples who've been together a longer time. Okay. And may not have, or, or they may not have told the family they married or became registered domestic partners. Right. They have made, maybe they did older documents. Maybe they were together a long time and didn't do anything. Um, one, one horrible scenario where a family typically will come in and fight is I have a document. I have a will and a trust, okay, mm -hmm. in my name. It says I leave everything, just for argument's sake, to my children. Right. Okay? But then I get married. And I forget to change my documents, which unfortunately happens. Or right. I forget to change my beneficiary designation on an asset. Mm -hmm. The family has a viable right to come in and say, this says we want this. The right. spouse's agent will then come in and say, well, they're married. He's got some protections now under the law, which right. they potentially do. But if he wanted to change his documents, he could have. He did nothing for all those years. Right. So the family is going to argue on that ground. So it's really important for couples to update their documents, to make sure they have documents and beneficiary designations um, the way they want them. You know, there's there's um, a lot of protections that can go into place, even if you're married in domestic partnership. This is perfect because it leads to, to, my, to my next question, which is a general question about estate planning, is that how often and under what circumstances do you feel that an estate plan should be updated? I tell my clients every three to five years. Okay, great. I say that doesn't mean you're going to have to make changes, but you want to look at it. You want to make sure that your beneficiaries are the same. You want to mm -hmm. make sure the persons you designated as the agents or the trustees are still the same. You want to make sure if you nominated somebody to be the guardian of your children in your will, make sure that's still the same because these things change over time. And as a young couple, we may designate our parents, but 10 right. years down the road, our parents are that much older and they may not be the logical people to be the guardian of younger children. So it's really important to just revisit it every three to five years. Changes are not required. Maybe the law changed and maybe there are some changes. Mm -hmm. Maybe the way we do planning has changed and you want to look at that and have somebody look at that with you. I tell people, you, you as your children are growing up, you don't know who they are when they're little, but as they're growing up, one may have a problem with a health care issue. One right. may have a problem with drugs or something like that. Well, the last thing you want to do is put money in their hands at age 21. Right. There's issues with these children. So you've got to look at this because as much as we evolve through the years, these plans should evolve with us. That's very nice. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. Now, let's talk a little bit about you. Tell me about your story. You, I, I, I looked at your bio, obviously. So you, you're a New Yorker. Well, right. I've been in California since 76, so that's many years. Okay. 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 Um, I moved out here, got married here, had a, had two children, have two stepchildren as well. In my mid-50s, I realized I was also gay. And I was gay. I wasn't also gay, but I was gay. <laughs> and um, um, I came out. My spouse has been lovely, and we're still friends, and we do all the holidays and things together. The kids... The kids have done well with it. So moving on, I was a late in life, uh, recognized myself as a lesbian late in life. So oh, I had already prior to that taken a very serious look into the, the LGBT world, mm -hmm. not for myself personally, but I had a lot of friends in the community. So I think I, I was geared towards that community when I didn't even realize I myself was gay. Oh, So I've been doing that kind of work several years before I even realized I was gay, which was interesting. I came out, I went to law school in Los Angeles here at age 40. So I was older. Okay. Oh, I, went on, I went on immediately and got my master's in tax law. And then I became certified by the state bar as a specialist in estate planning, trust and probate law. Very nice. So I've got those credentials. And um, being an attorney is a second career. Yes. 
Yes. What was the first career? Mostly business consulting. I was an accountant when I started out, and okay. then I kind of evolved into uh, doing more business consulting because I loved business. I uh, work with a lot of small to medium-sized businesses, just helping them through certain issues. There was a time when I worked for a um, human resource company. Got so it. I learned a lot about the human resource side while I was there. It was just a few years, but I was involved with that. So when my transition to consulting with businesses and things from accounting to, to that, I was able to help along the human resource side. I was able to help in not in product development. That wouldn't be my specialty, but the business side of the, the business. Wonderful. Very, very nice. And eventually, you know, so as you said, you were interested in the LGBT community prior to you yourself. That's how, and, and may I ask what sparked your interest? So you were not a member of the LGBT community per se, but you were already serving it. So may I ask, how did you, um, how did that happen? How did I begin serving it? Yes, I, I, I'm not really sure. I, I think I just felt a connection or I felt it was an underserved community. Yes. And I had several friends and a few family members that were um, in the community. Very and nice. they would ask me questions. And I, I, I felt like in our area, it was, it was underserved. Very so I nice. started working and learning as much as I can, not realizing it was my pull and my impetus, you know, to help me along. That's great. And that's that, the regressive, uh, you know, mindset. Very nice. Now, you're an educator as well. You were featured on the Wall Street Journal. You give talks, and, and that's wonderful um, that you share. Is are, are your talks geared to our estate planning? Is that the niche that you give talks about? For the most part, um, it's some aspect of estate planning or just general estate planning. For years, I was talking about estate taxes when our exclusion was very low. Okay. Um, I started talking about in the transition we were going through between 2005 and 2008 before marriage equality in California, I was doing a lot of speaking to the, the LGBT organizations and we were trying to advise them of what was going on. What is community property? What is domestic partnership laws? And then we talked about marriage as marriage came out and losing marriage and back to domestic partnerships. So there's a series of things, but for the most part, estate planning and estate planning in the community. I did some speaking or I did some articles on adoption issues and gifting issues, I think. Got it, got it, very interesting. All right, well, before we end, I have a little fun exercise for us to do. If you okay. would indulge me and play along with me, I have a list of 30 questions and I wanna ask them all, I promise. Uh, just, I would like for you to pick a number between one and 30. Uh, and so we'll find out a little bit more about the back of the business card, as they say. All right. Well, my birthday is the 28th, so it's my favorite number. Okay, perfect. 28. If you could be invisible for a day, what <laughs> would you do? <laughs> uh, it used to be follow my kids around. <laughs> but um, that's interesting. I have a passion for photography. Uh -huh. So I think if I could just do anything right now without any ramifications, I might follow some photographers around just to see, you know, their setup and their lighting and things like that. Oh, so that might nice. be fun for me. That's great. All right. Let's do one more. All right. 20. 20. Oh, interesting. It ties in. If you had a year off with pay, what would you do? Well, wow, that's interesting because that's probably the same answer. As I said, I, I've gotten deeper into my passion of photography. So I think I would be doing more of that possibly in a professional level, possibly just as I love to travel. So I would probably want to travel as much as possible during that time. I'm also trying to, I'm trying to write a book or two. I've got a novel going and I've got a professional book going. They may never get done, but at least I've worked on it periodically. A so. novel? That's interesting. Okay. We you got to tell, now you have to, because you brought it up, you got to tell me a little uh, bit, what is the novel about? Well, I just had a couple of ideas years ago and, um, you know, of course it's an LGBT love story. Oh, and, I um, you know, so it's actually half written and it wrote itself. The first half wrote itself. And I think they say that happens a lot of times. I'm struggling with the second half and I'm not, you know, I just, my struggle in part is not so much what I'm putting into the book because I think I have that outlined in my head. My struggle more is about my time frame and oh, having the time to sit down and do a couple of hours a day or an hour a day every day. So, you know, so these are the kind of things I might want to do if I wasn't working full time every day. Very nice. That's that's wonderful. Okay, before I let you go, 
we are going to have your contact information and in the show notes. But for those who are listening, what is the best way to get a hold of you? These days, the best way is my cell phone, 818-523-8320. Um, most of my clients I meet these days, I meet at their homes mm-hmm. or a designated place. I have an office in Glendale. But through the pandemic, things have changed, and I'm just right. um, doing most of my work from home. Um, I have a much better setup here than um, the office. So I'm in the Valley, and it's just easy to get around. I go north, south, east, or west, whatever I have to do. You know, sometimes clients will come in from Palm Springs, something like that. We'll pick a median place, and I'll, you know, a median place, and I'll rent an office over there for the day or something like that. Oh, very nice. Very nice. Great. Well... Wendy, it's been such a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you so much for your your time. Uh, Thank you, everybody who's joined the show to listen to this. And I will see you on the next episode. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Matthias. Bye. Thank you. Bye.